everyone. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us on this balmy Saturday afternoon. And welcome back if you have just joined us um, for the other two of our Telegraph Masterclass series sessions, which have happened today already. Um, hello from Yorkshire, from London, Guildford, Kent. Uh, I think I saw someone from Colorado. Um, I think it might actually be hotter than it is where you are here today. It's absolutely boiling. Um, my name is Pip Sloan. I'm the assistant food editor at The Telegraph. And today I'm going to be hosting um, Mark Hicks, restaurateur, chef and general master of all fish cookery. And he's going to be guiding us through how to get the perfect crispy skin on a piece of fish on a mackerel today. Um, and then he's going to be finishing it and teaching us how to make a crispy mackerel and pea salad, which is perfect for the weather. So hopefully any moment now, Mark will be joining us. Hi, Philippa, how are you doing? I'm very good, thank you. How are you? It's looking lovely where you are. Yeah. It's a beautiful day down here overlooking the sea. Gorgeous. A bit of that place. <clears throat> well, um, I'm going to make myself scarce and I'll drop myself from the screen and I'll let you get on with filleting a fish first of all. Um, and I'll ferry any questions to you if, as and when they come. Okay, great. Well, hi, hi everyone. And you've all probably got some mackerel in front of you. You may have got your fishmonger to fillet it, but just in case, you haven't, I'm just going to show you how to fillet the mackerel. Now, mackerel is probably the easiest fish out of all the fish to, feed, to fillet. Uh, it's got fairly soft bones, and these are nice big mackerel from uh, my friend who's got boats down in Plymouth. Uh, they catch them all the year around there. It's very deep water. Uh, in Lion Bay, which I'm just looking at the sea at the moment, uh, they're a bit few and far between, and they're quite small. So these are nice big plump fish as you can see. Now you need a nice sharp filleting knife and always when you're filleting fish you just go behind the gill at an angle. This is just so you don't really waste that much of the fish. So you can do that on both sides right back to the head. And then the secret here is, is to just run your knife as we're cutting. I'm going to do two fish just to show you how it's done properly. And just run your knife all the way along the top of the bone. And flip it over and do exactly the same on the second side. That easy, not leaving any flesh on the bone. And in some countries, and I've done it before, uh, Japan especially, they do crispy mackerel bones, which entails flouring them and deep frying them so they're really crisp and they're delicious. They almost disintegrate. Right, let's do it one more time. This is your last chance. So off with his head. And then use the length of the knife always. So if you're filleting, don't sort of try and do this. Use the whole length of the knife and you'll find it really easy. Now, what you do then is take away these bones which run through the belly. And all we're left then is the bones that run down the centre of the fish, which we call pin bones. So the easiest way, because we're going to cut this into smallish pieces and actually pan fry it, is just to cut either side of the bones, really. So if you go down the middle, either side of that bone, minimum waste. And so 
So that's simple. And you've got some nice quarter fillets. And now you've got completely boneless mackerel fillets. So what we're gonna do is just cut that into chunks. Because it's in a salad, you wanna sort of be able to eat it with a fork. So probably depending on the size of your fish, cut each bit into maybe four or five pieces. And then you need to get some flour ready. Now I tend to use this gluten-free self-raising flour all the time. That helps to give it a nice crispness and it's really useful if you're making a batter, a fish batter, really simple. You can use water or beer. So just season that up a little bit. A few turns of pepper. And I've got a pan here with some rapeseed oil, just heating up. You don't want too much, but we're not going to deep fry it as such. But if you can get just under a centimetre, really, of the oil in the pan, get that nice and hot. We're going to toss those through the flour. And that flour is going to get nice and crisp. Now, just whilst we're waiting for the oil to heat up, we're going to make the salad dressing. Now, there's a lot of talk about sustainability at the moment, and everyone's a bit jittery, especially if you've been watching Sea Spiracy. But let's not go too much into that because those small small fishermen uh, who you know have been suffering in the last year or so because they haven't had restaurants and hotels to sell their fish uh, so we need to support our local fishermen these are uh, caught by hand line so big long lines with lures on and these are caught by commercial fishermen uh, and they're just trolling the lines off the back of the boat so always check where your fish comes from. If you buy the fish from a supermarket, it should tell you, or if you buy it from a fishmonger shop, it should tell you or ask the fishmonger exactly where the fish has come from. What we don't want to be doing is eating imported fish when we've got so much fish on our shores. You know, England's quite a small island and we're surrounded by the sea, so we've actually got plenty of fish and shellfish. Hotter. Right, for the dressing, uh, we're going to do a pea and orange dressing. So I've got some peas which are cooked and shelled. You can use frozen peas if you want. Now what we're going to do is break some of the zest. I should have actually done this before I uh, cut it in half, but that's okay. Still, we're still going to get the same result. So your orange zest in there. So zest it unlike I did. We will mess up. And we're going to squeeze the juice. and just boil it until it's reduced by about half so the dressing's really simple i've got a little bit of cider vinegar you can use white wine vinegar if you want the juice and some rapeseed oil a little bit of seasoning I use Cornish sea salt because we're 
in that neck of the woods. So the juice is simmering. The oil is heating up. Just put a little, one piece in first, just to test it. It should be just starting to bubble a bit. Now, one of the most important things is to have a nice glass of wine with it. Now, this is from my friend uh, Tim McLaughlin Green at Sommelier's Choice, and it's got a nice fishy label. It's a really good fishy white wine uh, from the Lisbon region in Portugal, and we serve this at the Oyster and Fish House, and it's available from Sommelier's Choice. And it's a perfect fishy line, a wine, sorry, not line, as the label suggests. Good to drink whilst you're cooking and good to drink whilst you're eating. So carefully, piece by piece, not too many at a time, into your oil. Now have a little plate ready with some kitchen paper. If you've got a little deep fat fryer at home, you can deep fry it even. But a lot of people get a bit scared about deep frying things, so shallow frying in a centimetre or so of oil is perfect. Now the juice is reduced down now. I'm going to add that into the rapeseed oil and cider vinegar. Up. So as you can see with the rapeseed oil and the orange, you've got a lovely white, orangey, yellow colour dressing. We put the peas in. Now I'd suggest getting a nice selection of small leaves. If you grow your own at home, which I do, all of these are harvested from my garden earlier. So I've got a real mixture of parcel, which is a celery flavoured, almost looks like flat parsley. I've got some nasturtium leaves. Uh, I've got a little selection of um, baby kale, which you can cut and it comes back again. I've got some fennel. Uh, I've got some sea beet, which I transplanted a few years ago from the beach down there, and I just planted it in the garden, and it just keeps coming back. So there's probably six or seven different leaves in here, and I think the beauty of growing your own leaves at home is they've all got a lovely, unique flavour. Sometimes you buy those sort of slightly soggy, limp leaves from the supermarket, and they all taste pretty much the same, and they don't really last in your fridge. Uh, I've got some chives in there, and I've snipped off the flowers from the tops of the chives, so they add a nice bit of colour to the salad. Now the good thing with mackerel, because it's nice and oily, you, can, you don't really overcook it if you're cooking it like this, because that flour is giving it a nice protective Coating. We want to get it really nice and crisp. So I'm just going to flip them over. Get the whole lot really crisp. Now I'm not going to throw the mackerel bones away. I'm a fisherman. So I've got my rubby dubby bag here. I've got a little old muscle bag and I save up all the heads, the guts, the bones and everything. And if I go fishing for sea bream, 
I tie that onto my anchor with a little cable tie and that all the bits of fish come out with the tide and that's a good fish attractor well it is most of the time not all the time so that's crisping up nicely So we're just going to transfer that onto the kitchen paper. So we've got a crispy mackerel, we've got our salad leaves, We've got our pea dressing and we've got a nice glass of white wine pescador. So to assemble the salad, we're going to put a few of the leaves on a plate. We're going to arrange a few pieces of mackerel on there, some of the dressing. more bits of mackerel you can do this as a starter or a main course but it actually makes a really nice sort of spring summer main. mark we've got a, a couple of comments and a couple of questions um from from the audience yep. um so um for a start um barbara has asked she says that she whenever whenever she fries fish she dredges it in corn flour do you do you think like is that okay can is that a an okay yeah, yeah, you can use corn flour. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, the thing with this gluten-free flour, it does actually contain corn flour as well. And uh, right. yeah, the beauty of it is it doesn't contain any gluten, so yeah. it's ideal for you know getting fish and other items really crisp. Uh, yeah. And if you make a batter with it, uh, mm -hmm. it almost comes up like a really light sort of tempura style batter. Yeah. And have you got any alternative suggestions uh, for mackerel? I'm asking for that's for me because um, my boyfriend is allergic to mackerel, uh, but it seems not yeah. to other fish, which is strange. But um, but how, what other fish would you use in yeah. place of mackerel? You could use any fish, really. I mean, just because of the nature we're cooking it, you could use whiting, you could use place, you could use yeah. lemon sole, uh, all sorts of different fish, really. So it's not just mackerel but because it's that kind of season at the moment and uh, that slightly oil oily flavor of the mackerel you know goes perfectly yeah. with that slightly acidic dressing so yeah you can use any fish really so any any fish really you could place lemon sole gurnard is a good one uh, i wouldn't use some of the sort of what i call the first division fish like turbot dover soles okay. uh, you can get away with you know sort of second and third division fish for this um we've got a question it would trout be good for this recipe do you think yeah trout's good i've made something mm -hmm. similar with trout uh so yeah i mean you know really use whatever you can get hold of you know and if you fish yeah it's a really good way to use up some of those smaller species that you know aren't really sort of you know plate sized fish yeah someone has just asked um what your favorite fish is uh it depends what i'm in the mood for and what I've caught uh, on a hot day overlooking the sea with a nice glass of wine, you can't beat, you know, getting stuck into a whole crab. Uh, oh, yeah. But, you know, I, I used to catch mackerel when I was a kid. Uh, so it is yeah. still one of my favorite fishes. Uh, it's, it's a very underrated fish, but you've got to eat it dead, dead fresh, you know, within sort of two days of it being caught. In the first division, you can't beat a bit of turbot poached yeah. or simply roasted barbecued mm. um <clears throat> joanna has also asked um whether you could do the fish in an air fryer and use less oil if possible or do you think it needs to be done um in a frying pan yeah i mean i've as, as you see i've just got about you know less than a centimeter of oil really uh, yeah. and 
the thing is having a bit of a quantity of oil is that uh, it just helps it to get evenly crisp, you know, all, all the yeah. way around the piece of fish. Yeah. Um, Ian has also asked about, um, you say that you keep the fish heads and the fish bones um, for when you go fishing to use as bait. Um, he's now asking about how you make a fish stock and yep. what kind so of fish ingredients you put into that. Yeah, so fish stock is best made, not, not really with mackerel bones, although I have made a, a kind of Asian style fish broth with mackerel bones by blanching them yep. first and then making a stock with some ginger and that sort of stuff. But generally good white fish bones, uh, mm -hmm. from, you know, any white flatfish, cod, haddock, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And the secret with the fish stock is not to boil, boil it too fast, just nicely simmered and only cook it for about 20 minutes. Okay. And what kind of other flavourings do you put in there? Uh, so normally a bit of onion, a bit of leek, peppercorns, thyme, bay leaf, a little bit of fennel if you want. Because uh, what you're trying to do is get, you know, the maximum flavour from the fish heads and the bones. So, you know, whenever you go to a fishmonger's, uh, always ask him for the bones. At my fish yeah. truck, there's quite a few customers that, you know, will watch me, you know, prepare the fish in front of them. And I put all the bones and heads in a separate bag and they can go home and make fish soup or fish stock with it. So, Brilliant. You know, especially if you want to make fish soup, you know, you get a good yeah. uh, second meal out of it. Mm. Um, we're also all wondering whether you're using an induction hob right now rather than gas. I am. I <sighs> I converted to induction a few years ago, uh, working in sort of commercial kitchens, you know, restaurant kitchens mm. and hotel kitchens. We were brought up using gas. Yeah. And at the fish house now, we've just got a new induction cooker. And, it, you know, as you can see, it's very clean. Uh, the heat is immediate. Uh, you can uh, simmer, you know, just at the touch. Yeah. And... If something spills over, you know, those old range cookers, which was all the rage, uh, you know, you have to take the thing apart, you know, scrubbing it and then trying yeah. to pick up the hot bits to go back on top. Uh, but the beauty of this, you know, you can just wipe it clean. And I quite often use it as a work surface for, you know, rolling out pastry and things. Mm -hmm. So it's a nice sort of visual thing to have in your kitchen on the worktop. This is a Fisher Pikel one. Uh, I've got a good steam oven and a convection oven that goes with it. And I, I, I'm never going to look back, really, you know, so I think yeah. induction. And also, it's obviously, it's very uh, heat efficient and yeah, energy course. efficient. So. Um, so do you use those in all of your in all of your restaurants and kitchens at the moment, then? Uh, well, I use it at the fish house. So we use mm -hmm. a mixture there of um, electric grill and induction. And when I had it recently installed, uh, you'd be amazed by the, you know, the heat in the kitchen. It just completely dropped, you know, because when you're busy, you know, doing a full restaurant, you know, you've constantly got the gas flames going. So that the whole yeah. of the kitchen is heating up. Whereas if you use an induction, you know, it's just very immediate. It's cold and then it becomes hot. So mm -hmm. I think it's certainly the way forward. I wouldn't have said yeah. that 15 years ago, probably. But now, <laughs> now it's a way of life. Yeah. Um, someone has just asked, how many heads and bones do you use to make a stock? Um, as many as you can, really. I mean, what I tend to do is save them up in a deep freeze. Mm -hmm. And then when you get maybe a kilo or something, you can make a stock, uh, you know, reduce it down to strengthen it, and then freeze the stock in small amounts so that you can use it as and when. Yeah. So it's probably Brilliant. worth making with a you know good quantity, half a kilo or a kilo. Yeah, so quite a lot then. Yeah. Yeah, but the best thing just save you know have a Ziploc bag in the freezer, and just yeah. add to it if you eat a lot of fish at home, skins, bones, heads, the whole lot. Yeah, uh, and just in general, um, because obviously um, the past couple of weeks hospitality's really opened up again for indoor dining and everything, and you've got your restaurant, your pub, and your your fish truck. So. How are you kind of spreading your time amongst all of those and, and what are you what are you kind of up to at the moment? Yeah, so my day normally involves I wait for the messages from the chefs. They either want um, some fish collected from the fishermen down on the quay. They either want me to go to the beach and you know cut some sea spinach or sea aster or 
sea cow. Uh, so that's like my early morning job. I sneak down to the car park. A lot of the visitors and even locals look at me and wonder what I'm doing. I'm sort of gently harvesting big patches of sea spinach, except the yeah. council last week trimmed it all. Mm. So I, I was kept carefully sort of cultivating the sea spinach and it just comes back up. Uh, so now I have to go down to Axmouth uh, to uh, get the sea spinach. So I'm, I'm in both the pub and the restaurant, you know, every day, lunchtime, dinner, vice versa. And mm -hmm. I'll do my fish truck on Friday mornings and Saturday mornings. And again, I'm, you know, using local fish. And uh, when the weather's a bit rough here, I can get it from my friend in Plymouth, Lewis, who's got uh, boats there. So they can fish for different species there, like red mullet and monkfish, which the guys here don't get. Yeah. And also all sorts of other species. So we've also, you know, always got a nice regular supply of uh, good fresh fish and, you know, direct from the fishermen themselves. Yeah. Have you got a favourite dish at the moment on the menu? Uh, what's my favourite dish at the moment? At the pub, we're doing a mutton chop curry. We sort of alternate between uh, a roe deer or mm. seeker deer curry and a mutton chop curry. And probably at the fish house, I mean, the menu sort of changes there and the fish is cooked really, really simply. Uh, so the dishes sort of range really from everything like we do a cockle popcorn. We just recently this week got some lovely uh, garlic scapes, which is before the, the heads of the garlic start uh, um, forming, uh, it shoots up these long, almost asparagus looking uh, shoots which you chop off and then that uh, puts a lot of the energy into the actual garlic uh, bulbs mm -hmm. themselves and you just steam them or boil them and we've been doing them recently with uh, steamed cockles from pool oh delicious so yeah so it's a um, regular change menu <laughs> Uh, we have a couple more questions about um, about fish cooking. Um, Arthur has said, how do you minimise fish cooking smells? Uh, point. Two things, really. Make sure you've got really fresh fish. Mm -hmm. Guys, can you smell fish in this kitchen? No. <laughs> uh, because, you know, if you buy smelly fish, that's one thing not to do. If you go near a fishmonger's and it smells of fish, it's yeah. not a good sign. Uh, and likewise, you know, when you're buying fish, you know, there's lots of qualities. Uh, you know, the eyes should be nice and bright. Mm -hmm. The skin should be nice and shiny. And, you know, when you're cooking fish at home, unless it's something smoked, for example, then you know, it shouldn't really, you know, smell of fish. Yeah. Um, someone has also asked, um, can the same technique for filleting the mackerel be applied to, to all sorts of other fish? What other kind of fish do you do the same same thing with? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the time I tend to cook the fish on the bone. You know, so if it's turbot, sole, uh, even mackerel, I, I think you get a, such a better result cooking the fish on the bone, nice and moist. Mm. And also at home, it's very simple. You know, if you have a nice chunk of um, cod, haddock, pollock, turbot, you know, you just get your oven as hot as it can and you can just yeah. season it, put a little bit of oil and cook it straight in the oven, no messing. Because I think a lot of people are scared of cooking fish and I think yeah. that's why a lot of people don't eat fish. Uh, but don't be scared of cooking fish. Just cook it really, really dead simple. You mm -hmm. don't need to make it fancy sauces to go with it. And yeah, just cook it on the bone as much as possible. Yeah. Uh, and that way it stays nice and moist and you'll get maximum uh, flavour from it. Have you got kind of a, a tried and tested, fail-safe way of finding out whether your, your fish is perfectly done? Uh, yeah, my fingers. There were mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> years of um, working your way in the kitchen. You know, it's a bit like <laughs> cooking a steak. You kind of know by prodding it or pushing yeah. it that it's done. But, yeah, and another way is just to put the point of the knife if you're cooking it on the bone, just insert it and then put it on your tongue if the, mm. you know if the knife is soft uh, it's hot rather then your fish is done yeah there's lots of little tricks of the trade like that but i think the more and more you get used to cooking fish uh, the easier it becomes yeah 
Um, Cynthia has said, does it matter for this recipe if you don't have unwaxed oranges? No, not at all. I mean, this is just an orange I had lying around in my fridge that I use for orange juice. Um, but actually another little trick is uh, the blood orange season's finished now, but I've been squeezing blood oranges at home. And what I do is I freeze the orange um, shells. Mm. And when I get a kilo or two, I make that into marmalade. Oh, genius. So they would go normally in the compost. And then when you're digging up your compost, you sort of find these whole orange shells whilst everything else is composted. So I've got a really quick and simple way to make homemade marmalade. Mm -hmm. You boil them, cover them with water, put them in the pan, boil them for about an hour or so. Uh, and then you hook them all out, add your jam sugar to the pan. And then you just shred these up uh, finely or chunky up to you. And you then add it back to the pan, which has got the, the, the liquid from the oranges and the jam sugar. And then you just sort of simmer it until, you know, the liquid thickens and you just do a little tester by putting a little bit of the liquid on a plate in the fridge. Mm. And if it sets, then your marmalade's done. Yeah. A lot of the old fashioned ways is, you know, you end up zesting the oranges and <laughs> shredding it finely and stuff. But I've, I've found by far this is the best um, and easiest way to firstly use oranges that you've juiced in the morning. And uh, secondly, it's dead simple. And, you know, by freezing the oranges as well, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you're not wasting anything. Yeah. Brilliant. Two recipes for the price of one. Exactly. And then, you know, in the winter, you can make a nice orange marmalade pudding, steam pudding. Yeah. Um, John has... To the mackerel heads go in my bags in the freezer for fishing and the oranges <laughs> also go in the freezer and I've got a big bag room here actually I'll show you. <laughs> it's almost time it's almost time to make marmalade Look. so this is just in case you think I'm lying <laughs> <laughs> so I've got a bag of you know so when the blood oranges were here it's fantastic to make uh, marmalade with so I reckon over the next week, I might be making some marmalade. Um, and another question is just what kind of alternative leaves um, do you, would you recommend for, for a salad like this? Um, as opposed well, to something you're growing yourself, just, you know, in case you don't have a space yeah, or, so, or able to. Yeah, so, I mean, like, green grocers and supermarkets now, you can get lots of good individual leaves like, um, you know, rocket and that sort of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. If you go to a farm shop, there are often leaves there that are grown by local um, growers. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, all these lovely little leaves. Yeah. You know, they're tasty. They've got their own individual flavours. Mix them with some herbs like flat parsley, chives, chervil, yeah. that sort of stuff. And that really gives the salad a nice, a nice boost. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if, if you have got a bit of a garden, then you can just put this these salad mixes in, I, I, I always mix them together and just put them out and you can cut them, you know, up to sort of 10 times really. And the more you cut them, the stronger they get. Yeah. So I would strongly recommend just doing a nice little tasty salad mix at home. Mm, definitely. Um, can I also ask what kind of frying pan you, you have? Would you have any recommendations for a really a good non-stick frying pan for doing fishing? Because a lot well, of the time you kind of break the skin of the fish if you're trying to flip it. Yeah. You know what? Over the years, I've got through so many expensive non-stick frying pans, and I discovered that IKEA do this really good. Really? Frying pans. Yeah. I mean, it's, it looks quite industrial. We actually even yeah. use them in the kitchen at work. You know, it's heavy. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't peel off. Uh, you know, they're quite sort of industrial looking, but. I've had this one now for about three years and it's fantastic. This is also a smaller IKEA one. Yeah. So everyone's going to be rushing to IKEA now. And also, they're oh, not expensive. I'm going to have to get them before it's they sell out. Yeah, 20 quid or something. So when it does eventually go, you know, you just throw it in the bin and start again. <laughs> um, we've also got a question um, from Helen who says Does Mark have any tips on when and how to use samphire with fish dishes? Yeah, I mean, samphire should be appearing in about a month's time. So normally quite a short season for a few 
you know, for about four or five weeks. Mm. Uh, but you can pick most of the year round uh, sea spinach, which is this one. So if you live near the coast, but these lovely little sea spinach leaves, mm -hmm. uh, you can pick sea purslane, which is quite bushy, tiny leaves. And all of those different uh, seashore vegetables have, you know, a great flavour and perfect uh, for, you know, just sort of lightly steaming or boiling and scattering on your simply cooked fish. And likewise with samphire, you know, you could add samphire to a salad like this. Mm -hmm. You could just gently steam it. <clears throat> you can serve a plate of it as a starter or a side dish with fish. So I think all of those natural uh, growing sea vegetables, you know, are a great accompaniment to fish dishes. And if you live by the yeah. sea, then they're full as well. So. Yeah. Um, if you were it, kind of serving it as a, a side dish, um, what would you dress it in? Would you just do it very simply with something like olive oil and salt? Yeah, and a, bit of... a little bit of butter or oil, if you like, um, mm -hmm. and cook it really briefly, you know, like 20 seconds, boiling water yeah. and 20 seconds in and out, toss it in butter and it's delicious yeah yeah brilliant well um i don't think i have any more questions from um from our live chat uh, but if anyone has any then feel free to fire them over and we'll send them over to you um but for the meantime um mark so how how have you found the past kind of two or three weeks being open indoors mm -hmm. has it been quite hectic uh, yeah, not too bad. I mean, we, we're lucky that we've been blessed with both the pub and the fish house. You know, we've got lots yeah. of outside space. Uh, the local council have been very kind to me at the fish house and given me an extra bit of land. So I built a new terrace, which mm -hmm. is almost the size of the restaurant. Uh, so we've been doing, to be honest, I mean, even with social distancing, we've been doing similar sort of numbers to, you know, a busy normal summer. And, yeah. you know, um, if the sun stays out like this, you know, I think we're going to have a cracking summer. But yeah. I feel sorry for those pubs and small restaurants that haven't been able to open with outdoor yeah. dining. You know, they've really suffered. Uh, but, you know, hopefully when it does go back to normal, I, I don't think it's going to be the 21st being unoptimistic. Uh, but I think everyone, you know, should have a good rest of the season. If, if the summer extends... It was, it was a bit late starting this year, wasn't it, spring? Uh, it was, yeah, it was very late starting. <laughs> it's still frosty until you know, a month or so ago. Yeah. So, uh, so I'm just feeding the, um, the crew here with some more wine. <laughs> they deserve it. Jennifer, I think the whole of the hospitality business you know, does deserve to get back on its feet. Because, yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I don't want to keep banging on about it, although I do every week in the Telegraph, my magazine column, uh, is that we've all had a really tough time. And, you know, customers have been great. They've been really sympathetic and supportive, you know, towards, you know, the whole thing. So I think, you know, number one, we've got the support. Number two, everyone's, you know, well, most people are going to be staying in the UK, you know, during the summer. So I think we've got yeah. a really nice sort of naturally uh, made business. Uh, and yeah. I think people are going to end up, you know, discovering parts of the country that they maybe haven't visited before. You know, great for kids instead of flying off to Spain or wherever they go. You know, let's yeah. discover, you know, just explore some of the English countryside and seaside. Yeah. Um, someone has actually just asked, when will the rooms be ready at the Fox? People keep asking that. Uh, the first room is almost ready. In fact, it's, it's, it's strange because, you know, the hospitality business has suffered with staff shortages because a lot of the Europeans went back. I don't know if they're going to return. And likewise with um, building companies, you know, they've struggled with staffing. They've, all, you know, been really busy during lockdown, you know, rebuilding houses, doing people's gardens. Yeah. And, you know, also, you know, short on labour. Uh, so I've sort of slightly suffered that, you know, my first room has taken probably three months, but it should have taken maybe six or seven weeks. Yeah. But the first room is almost ready and the second room hopefully will be started, well, we, we sort of started next week and I'm hopefully get, by the end of the year going to have about eight bedrooms. 
Fantastic. And all very, all very different. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Mark. I think that's pretty much all we've got time for tonight. Um, but thank you, everyone, for coming and listening. And keep up with me on my column. <laughs> yeah, of course. And keep up with Mark and his column. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>